Although, so sorry. I'm, not, I'm not even going to jinx myself. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Malika Albrecht, and I am the editor at Redheaded Stepchild. And this is your reminder that we are open for submissions the month of February. We would love to see your rejects. We only accept poems that have been rejected elsewhere. And we will be um, open for submissions the entire month of February. Uh, tonight, I'm super excited because uh, even though Rebecca and I don't live far from each other, we, we don't get as much of a chance to see each other as I would like. Uh, she has come to the farm, um, but Rebecca is an amazing person, um, fabulous writer, and just all around poetry lover and someone who creates community and does so much to really showcase other writers that it is an honor for me to take a moment and really get a chance to celebrate you and your latest accomplishment. I'm going to read a brief bio and then I'm going to turn it over and I want to say a reminder that we'd love to hear you for open mic at the very end of our um, tonight we'll be having open mic and if you haven't already signed up please feel free to do so just send me a message via the chat section. Um, one of the first book-length studies of Robert Morgan, Com Community Across Time, considers the Appalachian writers' explorations of memory, family history, and landscape. It provides a study of all of Morgan's fiction to date, as well as a chapter on his poetry and some references where appropriate to his nonfiction. Rebecca Godwin examines the family history that informs much of this body of work offering an extended biographical essay that ties characters and plot details to Morgan's ancestors' lives and to his own experiences growing up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And what's really cool is we've already had conversation of someone whose thesis director for the MFA was Robert Morgan. Um, so I'm going to turn it right over to you, Rebecca, and I'm so grateful you are here. And I'm trying to remember... Would it be helpful if I make you co-host? Is there anything that you need to show us? No, okay, I didn't prepare. I'll just hold the book up. <laughs> We're happy with that. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah. Well, it's you're so gracious to have me uh, here, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, I look forward to all the good company tonight, uh, and just am, am thrilled to talk about Robert Morgan. So Community Across Time is his phrase, of course, but the name of it is uh, Robert Morgan's Words for Home, Community Across Time, Robert Morgan's Words for Home. And uh, as Malachia was mentioning, you know, memory and family and his little place in the world, Zirconia, which is close to Hendersonville up in the mountains, is home. And he writes about the ancestors and the family and the dirt and the Cherokee and the universe. So home is really uh, the world uh, and not just his family members, I think. Well, I spent the afternoon, uh, you know, reading through some poems and trying to pick a few to read. Uh, I do talk about a lot of the poems in the biographical chapter a little bit and in all the chapters on the fiction because he writes about the family in both fiction and uh, poetry and about history and building the roads through the mountains uh, and so forth. So everything kind of weaves together, uh, it's cut from the same cloth, as he said. Uh, so I just picked out a few poems that I like, actually, and we'll see how this goes uh, to focus on poetry. I did end up with a short separate chapter on poetry because uh, he's just published his 17th book of poetry, I think. I've just ordered it uh, after publishing his first in 1969. So I felt uh, guilty not to focus on the poetry a little bit more than I had in just weaving the poetry into the uh, fiction chapters. So I have plenty to choose from, and I've just read around this afternoon and reminded myself of what I liked and picked some poems. Uh, the first one, I think, that's not, you know, often the one that people think about first with uh, Robert Morgan, but it illustrates uh, so well his uh, focus on the natural world and the 
the uh, cycles of the natural world and the resurrection that's inherent uh, in the natural world, as he does in so many poems. And this one is called Loaves and Fishes. Uh, and of course, that probably rings a bell for some of you biblical scholars. So in a certain way, it brings in his focus on religion as well. And this one is published in his book called Terror. So it's called Loaves and Fishes. The deer beside the highway, dead and bloated, so its legs shoot out like barrels of some obscene bagpipe, seems already to explode as flies revolve and fizz around the eyes and mouth. The stench downwind is black and suffocating. Yet a few days later, you walk past the thing in summer heat and find it's been deflated. Only rags of hide and gristle, hair and bits of bone are scattered round, now greased with rot and sinking out of sight in flood of rising weeds and goldenrod, each atom of corrupted flesh identified and sorted, hauled away by scavenging coyotes, by maggots, worms, bacteria, each bite sent to its proper place to feed the needy multitude. So I just love that poem, and it is kind of the regeneration uh, that he talks about in the natural world, uh, kind of the sacred and the ordinary that uh, is important to him, I think. Another one that's right here in the same book uh, that I particularly like, uh, the wonderful imagery, the, the dirt, the, the concrete objects of the world that he likes to write about. Uh, here in a poem called Nurse Log, and again, it's the regeneration that's really easy to pick up on. The biggest trees in woods will fall and knock down lesser trees and lie out level on the slope beneath the gap that spoils the canopy. The trunk then rots inside its hull of bark and floats in leaves for half a century, the fallen god, a relic of fertility. The carcass hollowed out will spill rich compost from its shell and house a bear or host a fox or skunk. But as the giant molders down and seeds take root in mineral rot, new sprouts appear along its length and soon a line of saplings claim the breast of the gold quartz that bears, like Johnny Appleseed's canoe, a trove of seedlings in the wild to land them on the future shore. Uh, these are wonderful poems for teaching, giving the students to pick out, you know, opposition and movement and, and imagery and so forth. And of course, uh, Morgan, having grown up on that little farm in Zirconia and, you know, digging in the dirt and planting beans and harvesting beans and playing in the woods and finding arrowheads and so forth, uh, milking the cow, uh, getting the egg, eggs in and that kind of thing, really understands that regeneration that comes through the natural world uh, that he really explores in, in all of his poems. So, there's there's uh, some sense of that that natural imagery and regeneration that uh, is part of what I come to particularly in the poetry chapter and the uh, conclusion of the book. I thought I'd read one of his poems on his father uh, from Topsail Road. This is the poem called Mowing. And it clearly captures uh, so much about Morgan's father that he had to come to terms with as he came to be an adult and uh, was looking at his father's failures in a certain way that, that as he turned them uh, to, to himself. 
because his father seemed to have some trouble, you know, holding a public job and making money. His mother did more of that than the father did. They lived on that little one horse farm and his father worked all the time outside, but didn't bring in a lot of money. So this is a poem that shows Morgan uh, going back in memory uh, to describe some of his father's activities and also, you know, kind of coming to terms with his with his work and his um his sense of his who his father was that he came to accept more as he got older, I think. So the uh the title of the poem is Mowing and Imagine out in the country, most of us can imagine it. This is in the mountains, of course, a country road and the fields and the woods and the weeds and the briars uh, growing along the roadway. And Morgan's father is cutting the weeds with uh, just a scythe. Mowing. A summer long ritual for my father half dancing and half rowing into a weed bank, he gripped the handles of the snath and swung, beginning high and back and followed through, running the blade true to the ground and then up to winnow away the cut ends. Snakes and field mice and my mother's flowers got beheaded in his rage to mow and poke weeds, briars around the pasture were subdued to his measure. He even cut the shoulders of the public road, exposing beer cans and bags of trash, and once each season cleaned off the churchyard and cemetery acre. Mowing met his first requirements, solitude and no monetary gain. As he swung, he must have seen the heads of neighbors, deacons, wife and son, topple and the stubble bleed for their intrusion on his long reverie. That blade, a wide wing of metal, tempered in Czechoslovakia, soared around and back, making its deadly time regular as a pendulum, touching its flame with a hiss to the green stampede. But there was no end except frost to the siege of tender growth. Suddenly he'd stop and holding the scythe upright, take the stone from his hip pocket and whet the blade brilliant, spit on his hands and return to the lone war. I see him there now, wading in rampant vines, turning quick as a matador in overalls and wrecked hat, reaching back with his instrument to let the next wave of summer plunge past and wilt. So there's a lot of uh, negative here in this poem, of, of course, uh, that, that clearly shows the fact that his father did not like to be bothered a lot. He liked to stay outside a lot. Uh, I think I particularly react to that uh, cutting of the mother's flowers. Uh, my daddy used to do that, cut my, brother, my mother's uh, rose bush down. Uh, so just, just a wonderful poem, I think. And I look at the fact that it ends with wilt. Uh, kind of a negative there. So it's the cycle of the father's life of waiting to mow and really doing good things for the community, uh, but maybe not being so easy to live with all the time, as we say. So one, one of my favorites. So I need to go just uh, about five or 10 more minutes. Uh, is that right? That is perfect. I am happy to have, have you keep going, though. I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I have some questions, so keep at it. Okay, I'll keep at it for a little bit. Well, since I have a bunch of poets here, I thought I'd uh, read a uh, 
hand tomb. Uh, Audubon's flute from, from his collection, Cy Godlin, one of my favorite words, Cy Godlin, kind of askew and not straight. So a pantoum, of course, I had to write down my, my definition here, four line stanzas, the first and fourth lines of the first stanza appear as the third, first and third of the following stanza keeps going. And then the, in the last stanza, the first and third lines of the first appear in reverse order. So the last line of the poem is the same as the first line of the poem. So Audubon, of course, the naturalist, uh, we know the illustrator of birds, uh, kind of fits into Morgan's uh, focus on nature, the natural world, so important in his work. So I'll, I'll do my best to read this as it should be read. <clears throat> Audubon's Flute. Audubon in the summer woods by the afternoon river sips his flute, his fingers swimming on the silver as silver notes pour by the afternoon river, silps and fills the mosquito note air with silver as silver notes pour 200 miles from any wall. And fills the mosquito note air as deer and herons pause, listen 200 miles from any wall and sunset plays the stops of river. As deer and herons pause, listen, the silver pipe sings on his tongue and sunset plays the stops of river, his breath modeling a melody the silver pipe sings on his tongue, coloring the trees and cane breaks, his breath modeling a melody over calamus and brush country, coloring the trees and cane breaks to the horizon and beyond over Calamus and brush country where the whitest moon is rising to the horizon and beyond his flute, his fingers swimming on where the whitest moon is rising. Audubon in the summer woods. It's just just lilting all uh, the, the S's. Uh, it's just a beautiful poem. So another poem whose form is very interesting is also here in this collection, Cy Godlin. Find it. Twenty-seven. A very short poem, and it's just a series of anagrams. Anagrams where we change the letters, the orders of letters in a word, of course, and make new words. And it's called Mountain Graveyard. It's 12 words, very short. I'll show you right here. And it pretty much has the shape and look of a tombstone, I think we can see. It's called Mountain Graveyard. Reminds me, of course, and kind of captures of Morgan's focus on uh, the dirt, on cemeteries, on ancestors, on honoring the ancestors, uh, the first words here, stone and notes, kind of evokes that focus on writing that so many of his poems uh, seem to come to. So I will read Mountain Graveyard. Stone notes, slate, hails, sacred cedars, heart, earth, asleep, please, hated death. No punctuation in this particular poem, uh, even at the end. So I'm going to read that one more time now that you got the sense of the, the anagrams. Stone notes, slate 
tails, sacred cedars, heart, earth, asleep, please, hated, death, mountain graveyard. So since we're talking about death, I'm going to read two more. <laughs> Uh, one is uh, Morgan's conversation response to Dylan Thomas. If I can find Terror again. And it's, oh, I can't find that one. I won't read that one. I will read Living Tree. In his latest uh collection dark energy except for the one that was published last year that has both poems and um some stories in it uh he writes much much about science uh bringing in his scientific training of course and a lot of the poems in this particular collection dark energy dark matter uh coriolis effect really do speak to uh our place in the universe and the workings of the universe and scientific theory and so forth. This is a poem we can plan to have at our memorial services, I think, or that's true for me. And so we can think of the cemetery we were just in. And this poem is called Living Tree. It said they planted trees by graves to soak up spirits of the dead through roots into the growing wood. The favorite in the burial grounds I knew was common juniper. One could do worse than pass into such a species. I like to think that when I'm gone, the chemicals and yes, the spirit that was me might be searched out by the subtle roots and raised with sap through capillaries into an upright, fragrant trunk and aromatic twigs and bark, through needles bright as hoarfrost to the sunlight for a century or more, in wood repelling rot and standing tall with monuments and statues there on the fall hill, far hill, erect as truth, a testimony to in ground that's dignified by loss around a melancholy tree that's pointing toward infinity. Yeah, I was reading uh, what you're posting there, some of the phrases, so uh, living tree. I'm gonna stop there and see if people have questions or let other people read their poems. How did you uh, start this project, this book project? How did um, I start? How did you have the uh, idea it? of yeah. doing it? Yeah. Well, uh, I, th I guess the truest pleasure was the first novel that I read uh, by Morgan. Presented a paper on it uh, down with Shelby at Pembroke. <laughs> there was a, a one-day conference on Robert Morgan, and of course he came to hear the papers. Uh, maybe Gap Creek and The Truest Pleasure I did. And I was, I was looking at, in those two novels, which of course are kind of family novels. I, did, I didn't know much about that at the time. Just at the, uh, the elements, the four elements, uh, really looking at nature uh, in that poem and how Morgan, you know, tied together the fire and the wind and the water and all of that and use that imagery in the fiction, you know, very imagistic and sometimes tied to, uh, you know, sexuality, uh, that kind of thing. So I, I, I think that then as I continued uh, reading his work, that commonality that I felt uh, because I grew up on a small family farm in Johnston County, uh, lots of family around as he experienced and just loving the dirt as he did. Um, this made me feel kind of drawn to his work. And so, you know, I met him uh, 
introducing him at some events like, uh, you know, when he was speaking about Boone and so forth. And just very much enjoyed hearing him talk about his ancestors and feeling how much he respected them. Uh, even though he did not follow in the religious tradition that he was raised in very uh, seriously, going to church three or four times a week in the Baptist tradition and the Pentecostal tradition that his father kind of followed. In fact, he has a poem, uh, Gift of Tongues, that he wrote about really been afraid when he heard his father speaking in tongues when he was little. Uh, it just seemed to me so such a broad-minded person, actually, and that came through in his work that he learned from everybody and everything that he encountered and seemed to have the ability to um, respect uh, it in a way that, you know, not everybody does. And then just talking to him, I could hear that tremendous knowledge uh, and knowledge of history that he uh, brings into the fiction to tell the stories of um, not just his ancestors, but what he's doing, as I argue in the book, is to tell the story of really American history. Uh, and he's, you know, focuses on the settlement in Western North Carolina and in Tennessee and the road building. And as I continued to read and reading the novels and the short fiction, I could see that he set out to and then did kind of cover everything <laughs> in, uh, you know, in American history. It's the American Revolution in the novel Brave Enemies and, uh, you know, the Civil War, uh, just kind of focusing on all the periods of time and seeing all the possibilities for, you know, creating these humans that lived <laughs> to make the world as we know it. Uh, and his sense that the past so informs our present uh, really intersects with, I think, with my sense of the past. And Thank you. How everything fits together. So anyway, just started talking to him and realized that he would be uh, open to interviews, <laughs> which he certainly was uh, very, very forthcoming. Uh, so it turned out to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Marjorie, because that's one that I wrote down, uh, you know, as I, uh, you know, was listening to you, Rebecca, um, your genuine, uh, you know, uh, interest in his work and love of the discovery of his work, like more of it mm -hmm. and putting it together is so obvious. And, and I wondered how you had started and was there anything along the way that surprised you? I was surprised by his ability, I think, uh, to write about anything in the world, you know, because I started with the fiction uh, and then went to the poetry, of course. Uh, you know, his poems, you know, Sunday Toilet and Dung Heap and, you know, Earth Closet and uh, Manure Pile. And it's all scientific and, of course, very learned. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, being it's, it's like Whitman, you know, uh, his memory surprises me and amazes me. He swears he doesn't have a photographic memory, but I don't know. He <laughs> 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 needs to remember everything that he's read. I uh, wasn't really surprised, but I was pleased uh, to learn about and, you know, interested in his knowledge about the Indians and the Cherokee and all, all, all of the tribes there and just his determination, I think, to weave, particularly in the poetry, uh, an honoring of the not honored uh, that, that's important to him, I think. So I'm, I'm going to Halloween in March uh, to the Appalachian Studies Association uh, to present a paper just on two poems and two stories uh, uh, on Devil's Courthouse and Judicola Rock uh, that, of course, he knew, you know, rock formations there in the area. But uh, clearly 
honoring, you know, this universal spirit, uh, not just the Baptist spirit that he, <laughs> he learned about in church. Yeah. Although he doesn't really speak negatively about that upbringing. In fact, he honors all of those church quarrels and that he had to hear, you know, in his yard as well as, uh, at the church, because he says that those people who were arguing about scripture were teaching him how to analyze text. Ah, oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah, I, I love, love that. that too. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Where would you suggest getting a copy of the book? And, you know, are you doing any signings? Could somebody reach out to you mm -hmm. for a copy of the book? I have a, just a few. Maybe I don't have any. I think I've sold all mine. It's, it's available on Amazon. Okay, that's what Amazon. I was going to say. I'll put the link yeah. into the yeah. chat section for everybody because I I, yeah. I know where all it's in, available. And I thought, you know, yeah. it's even listed on uh, eBay in uh, England, oh. by the way. Oh. <laughs> Keep but telling me these things that are interesting. Yeah, I was like, I, when I ran across it, I was like, well, that's a curious thing. But um, I'll put the link in for uh, people. Does anybody have any questions or any thoughts? As you know, I, I think um, I always knew he had a stunning way of phrasing things and of images. But I think I was aware of the musicality until he did read the mm -hmm. pantoum. And I was like, Master, that's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, he has a lot don't of. Think um... I knew that poems about music and banjo makers and so forth and he he does play piano so you know i think at one point when he was a teenager he thought he would be a composer yeah awesome. uh, rebecca and, um I'm, I'm glad you uh Jim? focused on poetry tonight uh you know that's of course one of my great interests i followed his poetry for a long time um i, I know a number of people who uh, a, a number of poets who kind of have a hard time with Morgan because his poetry is so, to them, so objective and so scientific. And uh, and we're sort of used to the subjective lyric and all that kind of thing. And uh, I just wondered if you had any thoughts uh, uh, about that. I mean, I know plenty of poets who greatly admire him, but all those poem titles that you were talking about, you know, they're 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 just very physical, gritty things that kind of illustrate scientific and natural processes. And he actually writes poems about them. And I know uh, some people for whom that just doesn't work well as poetry. <laughs> no ideas, but in things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Williams, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like that kind of poetry. I like, you know, just lots lots of things and objects because, and I mean, I, and I think he feels kind of the way he feels about the world. And I guess I'm assuming a lot that, that I know there. Uh, the important things are can be objects, are objects. Mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to um, our care for the world, and I didn't read any poems uh, that that show his worry about, you know, the passenger pigeon and um, what we're doing to the world, destroying the natural world. Uh, you have to understand it, I think, to care about it. Mm. And, and that's, I think, one argument for... Uh, paying attention to the things of this world. Yeah. 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 And thanks for that comment, though. Yeah. yeah. Very important discussion, I think. I always use the point okay. of his um, cow pissing when I start yes. the poetry section because it, one, it shocks students that you can yes. write about, you know, a cow taking a piss. And it's also a, it, today, this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. and it's also just a beautiful poem too, but um, you know, it grabs their attention and kind of shakes up what they think they're allowed to write about and what they're not allowed to write about. So exactly, exactly. I love that. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they that can't believe circles, you're reading it. Yeah. yeah. It, it also circles back to kind of the question that Jim was, you know, 
uh, kind of bringing up, I think, is, you know, what's okay to write about, you know, and, and I, I think, Marjorie, you really set the bar when you say this is a poem and you, that you pretty much say nothing's off limits per, you know, for right. topics. And that's, that's fabulous. Yeah. And I, I heard Bill Harmon once speak to him about his poem, Stretching. And Morgan said, well, you can write a poem about anything. And Bill Harmon said, you can write a poem about anything. I would never have thought to write about stretching, which I've read to students in deep stretch class. Yeah, just this, this tiniest little thing. <laughs> I may have to look that one up, Rebecca. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it to you. That's awesome. I would love to have that. Do we have any other questions or can we just take a moment to, you know, I, Rebecca, I really love your uh, fabulous way of lifting up writers and really um, the joy with which you embrace uh, writers. Oh. I, I just think that that's something that's so obvious. And when you are talking and anytime that you are, um, you know, lifting up the voice of another writer, it's just so admirable and it's so beautiful how you do it. Your joy. Oh, thank is you. Well, thank you so much. I found my happy place, I suppose, when I, <laughs> well, when I found literature and, so and writers. Right. Yeah, but I, you, you, you bring people into that community and that's just such a, it's a lovely gift. It's, I was really honored to be, you know, here and, and, and hear you talk about his work. And the, the poems that you chose, I think, were really well curated. It was lovely. Thank you so, so thank much. You. If there's no other questions, we're going to head towards open mic. Mm -hmm. um, it, and just a reminder, if you did want me, for whatever reasons, to briefly turn off the uh, taping, you know, if you wanted to make sure the poem is it's going, uh, you know, hopefully to its forever home some somewhere uh, being published, I'll be glad to pause our um our uh, taping if we need to. So for open mic, I have Cal first. And so Cal, make sure you're unmuted, you're good. I did, <laughs> I forgot I was going first actually. Okay, um, this is called Love at Gates Mill Pond. I'm looking over a bridge rail at the lake and they get closer, two gay men, I figure out for a stroll in the woods, older, maybe husbands. As they get closer, I hear the accents of their animated voices, the tone, a few phrases. Now I think they're two Southern Christians, maybe deacons, walking this Sunday afternoon after a church leaders meeting, sharing only the love of God. You know, we're all the same. Even me, we all judge from a distance. Then when things get closer, we find we're wrong. It's beautiful, really, the discovery. Thank you. It's beautiful, really, the yeah. discovery. Thank you, Cal. Yeah. <laughs> I have Marjorie next, who was a student of Robert Morgan's, and we were having that discussion. And I'm going to put you a spotlight, Marjorie. I'm really glad you're reading. OK, thank you. Um... There, am I unmuted? Yes. You are yes. good. I actually kind of surprised myself by raising my hand. I wasn't planning on reading, but um, I I just thought um, I would read a poem that I wrote when I was working with, with Bob. Um, and I can think of him giving me suggestions on this. And, um, and I think he pulled some strings because it's one of the very few poems I've ever gotten in Poetry Magazine. So I think he mm -hmm. called somebody up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I haven't read this for a long time, so I hope I don't stumble over it. But it's called uh, Cartography, and it's the first poem in my first book um, years ago. Uh, Cartography. Simple as a globe spinning or a quick sketch of the country. Thick black lines as borders, an ocean here, there. Maybe an interstate running through and a few rivers, towns. An entire state scratched on the back of an envelope, rough, rough draft of an atlas. You trace me like this, 
Don't expect a dirt path in Kentucky. Freeways wrapped around Chicago stretch to the East Coast. Don't expect veins like roads, heel prints, boundaries as strong or flimsy as fingernails, as lies. I'm pinned to place like girders on a bridge. Steel become cold, colder, like concrete stuck to earth in basements, construction sites. Sometimes tugged in and out of coves in a current too much like a lover, I float, half eroded, mouth full of pebbles. True, the shape of my face is in sand, mountains, and I sleep to the click of an SOS or not at all. Because of you, I apply bruises to my cheeks like blush, to my brow ash from the oldest volcano. There is more to this than silhouette, than map. What of your outlines? An inch into Ohio, you pinpoint cities. You're wrong. This circle is the pond I first made love in, the dot a patch of poison oak I wore. A millimeter away, the line where train and Buick ripped even the sky, severed then from after, while I watched a car behind. We draw and redraw maps to keep our footing, to find who and why we are, thud of fist, jagged cry of a child, whoosh of water taking in a body, here on paper. These coastlines are faint, fainter than breath, the barest stencil of all we want to remember or cannot forget. Thanks. Holy smoke. Nice. <laughs> Marjorie, that is fabulous. Oh, wow. I, I think yeah, I'm you know, jotting notes and comments. and. Yeah, that. I was going to say, so there's some, um, you know, notes in the chat section. Don't miss them. Thank you for reading that poem. Wow. Oh, yet another good night with our open mic. Mm -hmm. Christy, I wrote you down as a maybe and I wanted to go. Okay, no worries, my friend. Um, Julian, I have you next and I will, there we go. Make sure you unmute. Am I unmuted now? Good, you are live. Okay. Um, I'm gonna read something that's new um, it's up right now at a place called Extinction Rebellion Creative Hub. I was going to put something in the chat, which would be a link to it, but I couldn't figure out how. So I don't, I didn't do that. But here it is. It's called Winter Solstice 2023. This year, no convergence. Last year's Christmas candle for the Maccabees wrapped away with thanksgiving, chimeras now among others turning, pursuing courses as before. Once long ago on the Aegean, we named Arcturus herdsman, plowman, named Andromeda leader of humankind. Now we presume to calculate their mass, their movements relative to our space-time position. Are we more or less arrogant than our forebears? More or less than Johann Bayer, who produced in 1603, for a science still juvenescent, our first catalog of stars invented a naming strategy that survives today? Or do we feign surprise with Emily Dickinson that science has been very mean to change heaven's kingdom as the brightest star we see? Arcturus, his other name, sinks beyond horizons of yet another northern autumn, the pole frisking about among glaciers melt, monarchs having forgotten clover bells and milkweed, disappearing with countless humans, dead in endless wars, pursued with the latest technology. 
Holy. Wow. Thank you so much, Julian. Don't uh, forget to check the chat section. But I, I mean, you know, now we presume to calculate that one stuck with me as well. There's so much to that. Thank you guys for always bringing uh, poems in the end that were just, uh, you know, in the open mic where I'm just <laughs> speechless. Um, Elizabeth, I'm coming to you next. I want to spotlight you. Don't forget to unmute. Uh, you did it. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these are old, <laughs> but they just came out in the South Dakota Review. Oh. So you guys uh, have to tell me which one to read. There are two in here. One is called The Unraveling, and the other one is called... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> when It Rains. I'm sorry, the unraveling I wanted to wanted to hear. The the unraveling? Yeah. I like that too. Okay. Uh the unraveling. I try to read, try to prop this up. My mother slipped the yarn from its sleeve. She positioned me like a marionette elbows bent, palms facing each other. She found the end and began wrapping left to right, periodically stopping to free a knot until the yarn was wound into a ball. Every skein we worked this way, my mother and I, perpetually unraveling, winding and rewinding yarn from each of our hands, held, wrapped, tangled, and untangled. Over and over we worked, stacking ball after ball in her knitting basket. It is this way with grief, no matter the shape, how neatly wound, one snag can pull it loose, and then the unraveling, and then the starting over again and again. <laughs> Gorgeous, thank you so much. Yes. Boy, it is that way with great, that, that one just sticks with you that, oh wow, the starting over again and again. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I'm glad, now I also want to hear the other one, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll <bring it laughs> next time. Uh, Regina, I am coming to you. And there we go. Um, so Malika, um, when you talked about going to Ireland, I said, oh, let me see what I wrote while I was in Ireland. <laughs> so I'm going to um, do this poem entitled Truth Is, and it was actually inspired when I went to Derry. Um, when I went to Derry, and if you have any history or, you know, you know any of Derry's history, you know that Derry has had quite a tumultuous um, uh, struggle with social justice and, and things like that. Um, and um, initially their movement was, was to be based on the movement of Dr. King, um, and um, then they even had their bloody Sunday, but their bloody Sunday turned really, really bloody and lasted uh, quite a while. But I saw when I was there um, on a, a, on the side of a building, someone had written, and I don't know if you can see that, you probably can't, but it's on the side and it says, I can't breathe. And we are all, you know, familiar um, with that, uh, with where we... Yeah. First limit. Okay, this is entitled Truth Is. I have an epigraph. Weigh your heart against the feather of truth as the Egyptians did and purge its sun, but for your own sake, not your soul's. And that's from James Lasden in Blueberries. Truth is. Truth is there are truths on planes I have not explored, planes I know not of. My heart lives on 
one, two, three, or more, and my feathered truce cannot be measured against the feather of another, Egyptian or otherwise, though they too had their fall and rise, and the rise of their truth bloomed and withered and bloomed and withered, and as with circumstance has come again, and one day it will die. I've watched babies die, not just on TV. I held the child of a friend who took a tiny last breath and met her end in peace. And I could almost see God lift her, spirit her away, her exhale lighter, lifted like a feather. This is truth. God came for her, lifted her like a feather. Like a feather, I've watched babies die, often on TV, children whose mothers I did not know, dying in the streets, begging for mercy. Black skins battered by rage and fear have violently watched their breath disappear in cars, on sofas, in beds, on porches, calling and crying for help or shot down before they could even utter or wheeze, I can't breathe. Breath is the truth of life, but what of death? Death is truth and dead is not dead. I remember death and the after truth and my truths and the truth of my sister, my brother, both others is that there is no feather large enough to bear all truths. We have too many. We understand too few. Thank you. Holy cow. Regina. Yes. Just powerful. I, I mean, I, mm. Check the chat section. There was so much of that that I was trying to write down. I'm like, I need to see that in writing so I can hold that close. It's gorgeous. Thank Powerful. You. That's what Ireland does. I'm you. glad you went to Ireland. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm glad you went to Ireland. I, I, I may not come back with that, but that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm glad you were there and wrote that. It is stunning. Thank you. Um, Karen, I had written down question marks, so it's up to you at this moment. Yeah, your name for reading. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So this is, I, I don't think I've ever read this one. Um, this is one I wrote sometime after my second breast cancer. And so, yeah, and we're coming up on Valentine's day. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to read this poem tonight. This is some things you need to know about my husband, the skin beneath his t-shirt jeans and work boots is so white. The skin of his arms and neck and face is the color of deep earthy clay and it's wind burned, sun baked, weather leathered and warm. His laugh makes angels giggle. He has sexy dog teeth whenever a grin sneaks up on his cheeks. He has the biggest and strongest work worn hands that can never quite get the knot to get out of your shoulders. He's afraid he might press too hard. He'll be like a plank propped up on a straight back chair right beside you for four hours straight or more every time you have to have chemo at UNC Women's Hospital. And while his eyes will close, and while his legs will be straight out and crossed at the ankles of his work boots, even though you're hoping he's asleep, since he's coming straight off of paving the highway for 12 hours straight and getting home just in time for just enough time to wash his face and his hands before driving you up to the women's hospital. When the nurse asks him, sir, wouldn't you be more comfortable in a recliner in that glass doored room over there? We can turn off the light and you'll still be able to see your wife sitting here. He will always answer kindly and immediately with no, and thank you, and I'm fine here. Whenever you tell him he'd better not have bought you any presents, he'll avoid your eyes with his flirty grin while he insists that something you need is not really a gift. He is not a gifted fibber. He is a gifted gifter, and 
He will always find some clever way to fix whatever has gotten broken, even me. Ah, uh, Karen. Woohoo! I, I love, love my husband. Poem. I love that poem. <laughs> We're all talking about Brian right now. He is not a gifted fibber. Yeah, it's, it's fabulous. He's not. <laughs> I hope you have sent that and gotten it published. I, I haven't. Girl, I'm have on nag from here on in. I, I might that, I might try that. That is my new to-do list, Nag Karen. Okay, so then you can name me. About, <laughs> yes, that is going to be on my list. Donna, I'm coming to you. Okay. I um, I guess this is the Ireland night. I wrote this poem after visiting the grave of W.B. Yeats. And it's titled, one of his quotes, Peace Comes Dropping Slow. Like a late snowfall at the end of March, peace interrupts the silence of despair when all hope was lost for somewhat better days. And we wake up surprised by yards covered in white wonder. And we wonder when April rains wash all that beauty away, if a season will ever surprise us again with a bouquet of daffodils. Just when we lose the vision of yellow and green, roses bloom. And when we begin to believe in signs of repetition or something that we hope will last forever, fall brings its own uncertain days. Transience becomes the season of beauty and peace finally comes to stay. Oh, Donna, I love that. And I, I really like the title of Peace Comes Dropping Slow. Yeah, transient becomes the season of beauty. Yeah, that's one I of just love all of that. Yeah, yeah. thank you mm -hmm. so very much. Shamala, coming to you. Let's see. Oh, I see what I have and to I do. remember how to unmute. <laughs> you did it. Yes. I did it. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, uh, this is... Um, yeah, I'll just read it. I don't have a title. I tried to reach the star from NASA long ago. And before that, there was a river behind my house, muddy and brown. And before that, a hill that I climbed, but not too far because there were cobras. One came and sat on my toy piano in Kuala Lumpur long ago when I had missing front teeth and a princess dress and a doll taller than I and a father who loved me and gathered the men. They beat the cobra to death, and my mother beat me. My father did not stop her because he loved her, though he did stop them putting me out from primary school for playing truant. He could not stop them putting me out of kindergarten for pushing back at a boy who pushed me down. So I ran away once, and he came to get me after a mile when I was four years old. And then I ran away again, 15,000 miles when I was older. And he couldn't come to get me, although he loved me. It was many oceans too far from Kuala Lumpur, too far from Brown River and Jungle Hill, and the kind white school building with quiet shade and soft voice friends I left behind long ago. Wow, that one's sticking to me, and I'll tell you, the many oceans too far, right? I put far those two words in <laughs> after our conversation, Malika. I, come on, it, that is amazing. Uh, yeah, and and I, Marjorie, check the um, chat section because I, I love what Marjorie put. Such a beautiful reading voice and poem. Yeah, I, I want to take a second and give a shout out to Regina and Malika, who have been so generous to me this week, helping me figure out a chapbook. I think um, that's been the highlight of my week. <laughs> it's what I'm pretty sure Regina's not. Yes, yeah. it's true, well, right? It, she helped, it helped me as much as it helped her, maybe more. I, <laughs> I, I have to say, it's always fun to talk poetry with people that I admire. Uh, I have two more people left for open mic. Um, Catherine, I'm coming to you, and then I'll be going to Warren. Make sure you unmute. There you okay. go. I unmuted. Okay. 
Um, let's see, this month I had a couple of poems published in the Grayling Press online magazine. And as I've listened to every poem tonight, I'm, uh, it was tough to decide which one I should read. <laughs> I don't want to read X tonight because it's I like it. But after that wonderful husband, I'll save X for next week. And um, there was a lot about nature. So I'm going to read Sunrise on Florida Bay. Bright driving light bursts between floating shades and dust playing hide and seek. Watching clouds pass by, secondary images spark the imagination. Rookery music, susurration surround sound, vernal orchestra. Dawn awakening, porpoise corral their breakfast. Wonderful, alive, subtle, you arrive, spraying your vast array of brilliant color. Mangrove island keys, back into my beating soul, dress button would sound. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah, yeah I was trying to put in there, Porpoise Corral. I was trying to keep up with the quotes that I wanted to put in there, but you caught me off guard with the, yeah, oh, Elizabeth is asking for that last line again, if you would read it, Catherine. Oh, oh from for this one? Um, yes. yes. <clears throat> Mangrove Island Keys. Back into my beating soul, dress Buttonwood Sound. Mm. Buttonwood Sound is a bay in uh, the Florida Keys. If that Thank helps you. me. Yeah. Was that what you were needing, Elizabeth? Yeah. I like that Buttonwood Sound. There's something to it that kind of sticks to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I have to say, uh, next week, I'm going to remind you the X poem. Because I love yeah. that you said, after that wonderful ho husband, going to have to wait to read the X next week. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you. We're, our last uh, poet is going to be uh, Warren. And Warren's here for the first time. Warren, I'm reminding you to unmute and also start your video. There you go. And you just need to unmute if you don't. There you go. You're good. You're live. Well, I, uh, first of all, thank you all for having me here. Um, this is indeed my first time. And I was hoping when Malika, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, would oh. enable my camera. So, ta-da! Here's my Yay. cute face, even though it's dark outside. Um, so, I am going to share a song that I have. Um, so if you guys could just bear with me while I, uh, oh, it's not let me share my screen. Uh, do you need to share the screen? Is that something you need? Yes. Could, uh, could you do that for me, please? I'm trying to hang on a second. It might take me a second. I don't know why I'm having a hard time with that. Uh, nope, that's not going to work. Uh, Okay, I think I have to do it this way. Okay, did, did, did that do anything? That's the best I can do. Yes, perfect. You are on a roll. Uh, uh, okay, so without further ado, uh, in honor of Black History Month, uh, this is a poem, or not a poem, but a song, I guess, that I uh, recorded t about two years ago. So, hope you like it, and uh, here we go. Uh, last down at my watch, I had to see what time it is. It was time for some scotch, so I kept on drinking and kept on thinking about how many times I really kept on sinking. Trouble in my way, but the tears kept me through it. Get my body replenished, I had to mount and do it. Sip, 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 till I couldn't get enough. Trip, 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 though I tell you it was tough. Graduated high school, but my GPA was low. Now I'm busting off my ass, trying to hit a 4.0. My teacher walking past my desk to see if I would cheat. But the girls would tell you different, saying I was always deep. Growing up without my dad was the biggest heart attack. Trying to breathe is the simple consequence for being black. Rest in peace, George Floyd, man, you left us too soon. Hadn't sung out your name, such a beautiful tune, and it go. Remember that the only thing you have to change the world with is you. So be great, be pure, and be courageous. And never, ever give in. Is it really ever easy to knock on someone's door without the fear of them beating you viciously to the floor? Or being shot 
shot in your house when you were trying to store it. That's the part of being black that you simply can't ignore. Battery is worth the only thing to give me life. School wasn't the only place to find my future wife. At the bar, in the club, or somewhere in the mall. Or probably standing outside Carnegie Hall. Some of the biggest cartoons were in front of my eyes. I'm talking about the cowards who were telling me be wise. Hope to God I never run into those same people again. Or I'ma let them know directly who the champs are, my friends. Seeing eye to eye with my father, it was pretty dope. Listening to his heart beating like a stethoscope. God watching over us, broader than a telescope. That's how we dope. Huh. And it go. You're not a mistake. You are not a burden. There you have it. Thank you so much, Warren. I'm really glad that we were able to figure that out. I'm glad you were here for the first time. And I think that fit in perfectly with what um, we brought for Open Mic. Yep. Awesome. Make sure you check the chat section. Um, I want to thank everybody that was here tonight and especially Rebecca uh, for coming and celebrating your book uh, with us and Robert Morgan's words. Um, once again, yeah, great way to close out. You're right. Um, have a wonderful week. I hope to see you next week. And um, thank you guys for making my Thursday night amazing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks.